The Bible defines murder as the intentional destruction of a human life through actions that would likely result in death, often motivated by anger, hatred, malice, or a desire to cause harm. And most modern legal scholars would agree with this definition of murder also. But while killing another human being is tolerated in the Bible, in the case of accidents, in self-defense during a life-threatening situation, in defense of your home against an intruder, or in defense of anyone under your care when their lives are being threatened, murder is never tolerated. This is why the Sixth Commandment is properly translated, you shall not murder, instead of the popular incorrect expression, you shall not kill. So last week, I actually presented a very serious charge against the abortion advocates by stating that they are not simply pro-choice as they claim, but in reality, I believe that they are really pro-murder, because murder is the specific choice they wish to protect. Now today, as we learn some more about the delusional thinking behind the pro-murder movement, I will justify that very serious pro-murder label while building on some of what we learned last week in the message entitled, The Hidden Holocaust. The first prerequisite for murder is that it be premeditated or intentional. So we must ask, are women allowed sufficient time to think about destroying the life of their baby in their womb before they actually destroy it? Well, the pro-murder Guttmacher Institute, which has extraordinarily close ties with the abomination known as Planned Parenthood, explains on their website, every state requires that a patient consent before undergoing medical treatment and that the consent be informed. And, in addition to abortion counseling requirements, many states require that at least 24 hours elapse between the counseling and the abortion. Plus, they report that 14 states require verbal counseling or written materials to include information on accessing ultrasound services. And 25 states regulate the provision of ultrasound by abortion providers. So I think we can conclude that in America, every unborn child's mother is given time and varying levels of information to consider before they end their unborn child's life. And this seems to clearly satisfy the requirement that murder be intentional or premeditated, which simply means thought out beforehand. Now, the next requirement for the murder charge to stand is that the intentional destruction occurs to a human life. We saw loads of evidence last week from both science and the Bible that the child in the womb is a human being from the moment of conception. But this week, we will look at even more evidence from a legal standpoint, first from God's law and then from man's law. Now, when discussing how to deal judicially with the death of a baby in the womb. God said, If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows then you shall give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So if the woman gives birth prematurely and the baby is unharmed, the man who caused the premature birth will be punished and fined as the husband and the judges determine. But if the baby is harmed, then the judicial punishment is life for life. Without a doubt, 
The life of the unborn is equal in God's eyes to the life of the born. And this situation demonstrates that principle very clearly. And 38 American states even have specific homicide laws that apply to the baby in the womb, just as God does. Not to mention that at least 23 of those states have what some call fetal homicide laws that apply to the earliest stages of pregnancy. Here in Texas, for example, Texas Penal Code Section 1.07 relates to the death of or injury to an unborn child and provides serious penalties. And the law defines an individual as a human being who is alive, including an unborn child at every stage of gestation from fertilization until birth. Therefore, we can easily establish with legal precedent and the Bible that the unborn child represents a unique human being who is alive. Now, the third requirement for abortion to be murder is that the actions taken during an abortion must be likely to result in death. So first, we will look at the kinds of actions involved in abortion, and then we will look at the medical definition of death. There are two main types of abortions, medical abortions and surgical abortions. And under the heading of surgical abortion, vacuum aspiration is the most common abortion procedure in the world. The U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported in 2013 that in the United States, roughly 78% of all abortions are performed surgically and most of those surgical abortions were performed by vacuum aspiration. Now, what that innocent sounding medical term means is this. Typically, between five to 13 weeks into the pregnancy, the abortionist uses a small vacuum tube that is 10 to 20 times more powerful than a typical vacuum cleaner to dismember and evacuate the baby from the womb and to be certain that no legs or hands or feet were left behind, the abortionist will often use a rounded blade called a curette to scrape the uterine walls. A second surgical method used on more developed babies in the womb, typically from 13 to 24 weeks, is known as dilation and evacuation. This method involves the abortionist using pliers called forceps to firmly grasp parts of the baby in order to forcibly tear the baby apart. And finally, one other available surgical method of abortion is an abortive cesarean section or C-section as an alternative to an induced labor abortion. But in both cases, the abortionist intentionally injects poison into the baby's heart to kill it, and then they deliver the murdered baby. Obviously, all of these so-called procedures are heinous, violent acts of murder. But what about the sterile sounding medical abortion? Well, the term medical abortion is yet another delusional, deceptive use of language, and it would be better labeled murder with medicine. And the most common pill used to perform a medicinal murder of a baby between the fourth and 10th week of pregnancy is known as RU486. And since 86ing is a common euphemism for throwing something away, it appears that this pill is cynically asking, 
Are you for throwing a human life away? Are you 486? Blocks the hormone that helps develop the lining of the uterus during pregnancy. And since that lining is the source of nutrition and protection for the developing baby, the tiny boy or girl is brutally starved to death. Then, very commonly a second drug, administered after RU486, causes contractions and heavy bleeding, resulting in the murdered baby being expelled from the womb. In a saline abortion, designed for more developed babies, the abortionist sticks a long needle into the mother's womb. The needle contains a highly concentrated salt solution, which is then injected into the fluid surrounding the baby. The baby breathes in the deadly fluid, swallows the salt, and eventually dies from salt poisoning, dehydration, bleeding on the brain, and convulsions. After taking nearly an hour to die, while the baby was in pain the entire time, finally the mother goes into labor 24 to 48 hours later and delivers her murdered child. In 2013, 113 of these poisonous procedures were reported according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Clearly, no matter what abortion procedure we discuss, all of these malicious actions are clearly designed to callously take the life of an innocent child who's done nothing wrong but be conceived through no fault of their own. But before we determine we are dealing with full-blown murder, let's look at the medical definition of death to be sure that we are not exaggerating in any way. The Uniform Determination of Death Act, approved by both the American Medical Association and the American Bar Association, states two different occasions in which an individual may be legally declared dead. Irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. Though these stipulated conditions seem pretty clear on the surface, there have been several cases that have stranded certain human beings somewhere between alive and dead based on this particular legal definition of death. So is death only about brain waves and heartbeats? Well, as countless scientists will testify, human life begins at conception when a genetically unique human being springs into existence and begins the process of maturing over time. And scientists have even recorded that human life begins in a bright flash of light as a sperm meets an egg. So those same scientists may someday soon be convinced, when science catches up with the Bible, that death is simply the irreversible cessation of the maturing of a living biological organism. Under that very likely future definition of death, an abortion causes death in all cases, and even in the meantime. Any abortion after three weeks causes a death under the Uniform Determination of Death Act since the baby's heart begins to beat at around three weeks. About this, Randy Alcorn writes, I have interviewed abortion clinic workers who say that no abortions occur before six weeks and most do not occur until the baby's eighth week of development. Warren Hearn, in his textbook about abortion, tellingly explains, I have performed or supervised over 10,000 abortions from six through 24 menstrual weeks gestation. And Anne Ferretti, chief executive of the largest independent British abortion chain, British Pregnancy Advisory Service, has publicly stated, I accept that abortion stops a beating heart. 
But even if she did not admit to that fact, we could also point to prenatal heart surgeries that occur around the world and in the United States. And those procedures also demonstrate the beating heart of the unborn. So by the very definition of the Uniform Determination of Death Act, death is occurring with every abortion. Every single abortion procedure is intentionally engineered to destroy a human life. And because the procedures are engineered to destroy a human life, they obviously intend to cause harm. So we have clearly met the burden of proof required to define abortion as murder. But as we learned last week, delusion and deception are behind this whole abomination of abortion. And because of them, abortion is really murder with a twist. Remember last week, we learned that a delusion is something a person believes and wants it to be true when it is actually not true. That delusion factor is the twist in the murderous sin of abortion. We saw how the abortion movement relies on twisted words like pro-choice or a woman's right to choose when they're referring to choosing to murder an innocent life in the womb. We saw how they rely on twisted language like abortion, health care, clumps of cells, a woman's body, and reproductive rights when they are knowingly exterminating a precious human being with fingers and toes, let alone a heartbeat, brain waves, and REM sleep. And we saw how they rely on twisted logic when they say that a right to privacy somehow grants a mother the right to murder her unborn child. But all rational people would agree that murder is among several wicked choices that a civilized society can never tolerate. Clearly, the right to life supersedes the right not to be pregnant for any rational thinking person, right? And clear thinking people would all agree that the more helpless the victim, the more despicable the crime. Yet the lunatics are running the asylum in most of the media, academia, and the large portion of the government and the medical field and they consistently frame this issue with insane, delusional mischaracterizations that guide the discussion away from the truth. For example, one particular abortion clinic in Orlando, Florida, writes about what they call fetal demise, saying, Fetal demise is initiated by injection of the combination of digoxin and potassium chloride into the fetal heart to assure the following. No additional pain or discomfort to the fetus. Generally assures no chance of a live birth. The fetal tissue becomes softer, which makes it easier for the tissue to pass safely through the mother's cervix. And many studies show that a fetus that succumbs in the uterus delivers faster. Obviously, they know. This statement is about the death of the unborn child in the mother's womb. But they call the child a fetus. They change the word death to demise. They change the word caused to initiated. They change the baby's heart to the fetal heart. They admit there will be suffering for the baby, but the poison will prevent additional pain and discomfort. They admit the baby would have been born alive if they had not murdered it. They call the baby's body fetal tissue. And instead of saying that a dead baby delivers faster, they say a fetus that succumbs in the uterus delivers faster. Perhaps they really are so deluded that they think that these overt manipulations of language and their willing suspension of all reason and logic can be justified somehow, or perhaps 
they're just as evil as Hitler was. But clearly, there is a serious problem with their thinking. And there's also one more scenario to consider. Perhaps Hitler was as deluded as they are. Perhaps it is always delusion and deception that ultimately leads to this kind of human evil. After all, we learned last week that Hitler rejected the revealed word of God and he accepted the strong delusion that Jews were somehow less than human. So it seems logical to conclude that twisted thinking is always behind every murder and delusion is behind every despot. But the terrible tragedy of all this demonic deception is that desperate, confused women get trapped in the web of lies surrounding abortion and they commit a grave sin that they eventually regret very deeply. But praise to our Lord Jesus Christ who rescues us out of the darkness and the delusions that Satan has filled this world with. Truly, Paul is speaking to all of us when he writes, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. So we can all repent of our sins and turn to Jesus to live in the light and put all of this darkness behind us. And then, in obedience to the command to expose the unfruitful works of darkness so that no one else will be deceived by these deadly delusions, we must continue to shed the light of the truth on the lies surrounding abortion. And now that we have made our case that abortion is truly murder, We can next deal with the twisted morality that attempts to justify what everyone really knows is going on inside the woman's womb. Imagine that someone was claiming that it was morally good for a parent to murder their child any time up to the age of three as long as that child had some sort of issue classified as a physical deformity. Well, one international study showed 92% of children diagnosed with Down syndrome and 64% diagnosed with spina bifida were aborted when their condition was diagnosed during the pregnancy. And many parents are pressured by their doctors to murder their child in the womb if it does not measure up to some particular doctor's standards. Sir Robert Edwards, the scientist who presided over Great Britain's first in vitro fertilization delivery, said in 1999, soon it will be a sin of parents to have a child that carries the heavy burden of genetic disease. We are entering a world where we have to consider the quality of our children. Atheistic activist and scientist Richard Dawkins has said, It would be immoral to carry on with a pregnancy if the mother knew the baby had Down syndrome. And to these types of deluded individuals, I would warn, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The judge is standing at the door And he sees everything we say and do. And for those who reject God's word, we can add here that multiple scientific studies have demonstrated 
that nearly half of the positive results from prenatal genetic testing are false positives. Nearly 50% of the time, prenatal testing incorrectly indicates that the baby is at high risk for a chromosomal condition like Down syndrome when no such condition exists. Therefore, many people are being coerced towards abortion based on a false diagnosis. And in addition to the fact that every child has a fundamental right to live, regardless of their challenges, I would also point out that while most pro-murder advocates don't recommend killing physically challenged babies after they are born, many do recommend killing them while they are still in the womb, and that is twisted morality. This reality also highlights another perverted defense of abortion that relies on a geographical justification for murder. Just as murder of any child after they are born is evil and wicked, murder in the womb is no different. Location has nothing to do with being human or being valuable. Now, the pro-murder advocate might claim that their argument is not about location, but dependency on the mother. But then we should ask, isn't a newborn baby just as dependent on the mother and father to provide nourishment and care once the child is born? And does the dependency justification mean a person on a ventilator can be murdered? How about those with insulin pumps or pacemakers? If the dependency argument was valid in the case of the child in the womb, then these issues would naturally follow. Sometimes in desperation, the pro-murder side will revert to using fear and the logical fallacy of an appeal to consequence to try to justify murder by stating that if abortion is not legal and readily available, women will die in back alleys as they use coat hangers to murder their babies. But that's like saying that we should legalize bomb factories so that terrorists don't hurt themselves while they create explosive vests to kill innocent civilians. Murderers don't need to be protected during the act of murder. Victims need to be protected from murderers. Amazingly though, the most common justifications for abortion are actually based on finances, convenience, or family situations. In several recent surveys done in the US about why a woman might actually commit an abortion, the top five reasons in order were, 40% were not financially prepared for a baby. 36% said it was an inconvenient time for a baby. 31% said that they were not with the right man. 29% said they already had too many children, and 20% said that the baby would interfere with their career or education. Now the women in this study could choose as many reasons as they liked, and this is why the percentages don't add up to 100. But we can see that money is the number one reason, followed closely by convenience. So let's ask, can poor parents kill their children after they've been born? Can busy parents kill their children after they've been born? Is there really such a thing as a single parent? Did these women get pregnant alone? And how is it the fault of an unborn baby that someone already has too many children or some type of selfish career ambitions? Also, did you notice the first thing that each excuse has in common is fear and selfishness. And the second thing is that each mother's response indicates that the issue revolved around a baby's effect on their lives, not a clump of cells. The truth is that each of these top five reasons for abortion can be solved by adoption, along with nearly every other stated justification for abortion. But that is a choice that the so-called pro-choice crowd always seems to discourage. For example, one clinic in Florida has the following ridiculous statement on their website. They write, adoption is not an alternative to abortion because it remains the woman's choice whether or not to give up her child for adoption. 
That may just be the worst sentence in English I've ever read. It literally makes no sense at all. But before we give up trying to understand the delusional thinking of the pro-murder movement so that we can expose these lies once and for all, we'll move on to their most powerful arguments presented as twisted moral dilemmas. And before we address these arguments, which are the life of the mother and rape and incest, I want to demonstrate just how unfathomably rare these situations actually are. In a compilation of available information from the Guttmacher Institute and data from seven state health and statistic agencies that report relevant figures, William Robert Johnston has found that the life of the mother scenario accounts for only 0.1% of all abortions. Incest only accounts for 0.03% of all abortions, and rape only accounts for 0.3% of all abortions. And now that we understand how rare these very difficult dilemmas are, we will address them morally. In regards to the horrible crimes of incest and rape, why would one person being victimized justify an innocent child being murdered? As a society, can we justify creating two victims for these wicked crimes when only one victim truly exists? Do two wrongs make a bad action right? Absolutely not. Rape and incest cannot justify murder of an innocent life in the womb, but they would justify holding the rapist accountable financially for the woman and her child for the rest of their lives, in addition to any other well-deserved criminal penalties he should face. Also, imagine if Jesus were hypothetically somehow in the position of the victim. Would Jesus abort an innocent child for the wickedness of the child's father? Definitely not. For our God has said, The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. So finally, we are left with the life of the mother objection to deal with. In this moral dilemma, we're faced with the very rare problem of the life of the baby on one hand and the life of the mother on the other hand. In the case of a later second or third trimester threat to the mother's life, countless doctors will testify that a live cesarean delivery is the best solution. And in most cases, because real doctors strive to save both lives, the baby and the mother survive and go on to live healthy, normal lives. So the protection of both lives should be the goal. But in the case of a first trimester problem, like an ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube, at first glance, we face a much more challenging moral question. This is because logically, an ectopic pregnancy is a type of miscarriage or natural error in the pregnancy which will require medical intervention. But while a typical miscarriage spontaneously and completely ends a pregnancy without any human intervention or choice, the very rare ectopic pregnancy typically kills the baby, while sometimes requiring human intervention to save the life of the mother. This is because, due to scarring, inflammation, or an STD, the baby did not make it to the uterus where a normal pregnancy takes place. Instead, the baby implanted, most commonly, in the mother's fallopian tube, and it will not survive, even without human intervention. But in the extremely rare case, that the child was still alive at this point, if the child is allowed to grow in this location, it will most likely burst the fallopian tube and cause the mother to bleed to death. So, with the sole intention of saving the life of the mother, medical intervention, sadly, undesirably, and very rarely, ends the life of a baby which would have eventually died naturally anyway. We must pray that 
One day, medical advances will allow both lives to be saved in these situations. But at this point in time, mankind's limitations make this very rare occurrence an unfortunate reality. And the fact is that tubal pregnancies are an unavoidable, unplanned type of miscarriage that no one ever chooses. And dealing with these rare medical emergencies is not an abortion. And not even WebMD, the Mayo Clinic, or Planned Parenthood refer to medical treatments for ectopic pregnancy as abortion. So, in obedience to God's word, we can be 100% pro-life without exception, and we can call abortion what it is. Every abortion is the intentional murdering of an innocent human life made in the image of God in what should be the safest place on earth for every growing baby.